Moment, is it is it recording? Yeah, okay. Good. So welcome everybody then again. Uh, today's lecture will be about structure from motion. And uh, that is actually the problem of building uh, or estimating the motion between camera images and also building maps um, from, from camera images. Good. Um, as I said, Last week uh, we will have the, um, an uh, oral team exam, uh, which means that two or three of you will be examined at the same time. And I'll put up um, a sign-up sheet like this in front of our secretary's office, office and make sure to sign up there with your group. Um, as I said, if you can't find a good date together with your group or if you prefer to be examined individually, then, then let me know. But I would prefer uh, to have you examined as a group. And I guess it will also be less stressful for you to, be in a, <laughs> to come in a whole group. Um, good. Um, as I also announced last week, um, um, I've uh, put up the, the ICRA proceedings now um, on a website. It's linked from the course website and it, there are links to the PDFs from all the papers, including the videos. Um, so if you, if you like to learn more about this or if you want to use that for your mini project, then uh, this could be a starting point. Uh, I've put the username and password here and just in case that you forget, uh, just email me then uh, <laughs> otherwise. Good. Um, so uh, the, the structure for motion problem is um, uh, relatively complex. So I thought I'll split it up into three weeks, actually. And uh, this week we will we will look at the basic ingredients, which means uh, that we look at feature detection and descriptors and feature matching. Um, and then, as promised, we will look at the problem of estimating the 3D motion between two frames that we that we match. Uh, we will see how we can make it robust against outliers or bad matches between the images. And we will um, look at place recognition. So this is the problem. Imagine you walk around for hundreds of meters and at some point you look again at the same room. How can you efficiently determine that you've been there before? Or if you are an autonomous car and you're driving for hundreds of kilometers and at some point you realize that you're back home, <laughs> how do you detect that efficiently? Uh, good. And then so this will form the basis and then next week we'll look at uh, how um, uh, we can integrate this over multiple frames and then build larger scale maps, uh, how to do bundle adjustment uh, on this. Um, um, so, so there will be some nice videos and maybe also a demo um, of how this can look like. So you can, for example, take images with a normal camera and then put them into a structure for motion program and it will spit out then uh, the, a nice visualization of the camera poses and the, the 3D points in the world. Um, and then we'll also look at, um, so, so, so up to mid next week, we'll only look at normal cameras. Um, and um, then afterwards we'll look at stereo cameras, which, which give us depth images, which makes the problem different. And also at uh, Kinect, which is really popular at the moment in, in robotics as a sensor. And then in two weeks, we will more look at, at the mapping side, which means that we um, look at different map representations and how to really generate nice uh, visualizations of the maps, uh, which means, means, for example, triangle meshes uh, from a room or from a city. Um, and uh, also, uh, yeah, and, and really dense representations where a, a robot, for example, can reason about uh, free space and uh, occupied space. Good. Um, so to uh, uh, rem uh, show you again where we uh, uh, stopped last week, this was the KLT tracker. Um, and uh, as you remember, it uh, identified uh, in, um, um, uh, corner points that are easy to track, uh, and then it used gradient uh, descent or some form of uh, minimization to follow st these um, corners uh, through, throughout a video sequence. And this gives you um, uh, featured trajectories in, in the image stream. Um, the, yeah, so, so the algorithm again is that uh, it, it finds corners, it tracks them from frame to frame, and uh, whenever the matching between the current frame and the patch that we are, that we are tracking is getting too large and we just delete the track, and um, possibly if the number of tracks is getting too low, um, you can add more or in, in, initialize new corners then. Uh, but usually detecting the corners is quite expensive, so people only do that maybe once a second um, or so. So KLT tracker is really efficient and it's used a lot in practice and um, it can, um, I mean usually it has to track on a very um, high frame rate that, that the features don't move too much but if, if you have large motions then you can use a cost to find scheme. So this is just as a reminder from last week. Um, then 
uh, this is a video that I forgot to show you last week. So the, I, I said there was one pa pa paper at ICRA. Um, this is the conference building there in Karlsruhe. And then one guy was walking around with his mobile phone. And um, on the mobile phone, there was a KLT tracker running and a Kalman filter. And this is the position estimate that he gets out of it. Um, and um, this is a really long, long video. So he's walking around. You see there are lots of people in there uh, that potentially give wrong trajectories and so on. Uh, but, but still, uh, with, with his approach, he's able to uh, accurately recover uh, the motion. So now he's walking up the stairs and then doing a full round. Maybe I'll skip a little bit through this video. Um, so at some point, he returns, you know, and you see how, how accurate <laughs> everything looks like. Um, and uh, then he even walks, you know, outside um, back again, returns actually at the end to the same spot. And uh, the funny thing is that the, the drift, so the overall error that he makes uh, accumulated over the, the whole sequence is um, le less than 1% uh, of the, or yeah, if, yeah, significantly less than 1%. Um, so you, you can get surprisingly far uh, with this. Um, yeah, and this is, this is definitely great work. Um, however, um, the KLT tracker by itself is, as I said, based on image gradients, which means that we, you know, we recomputed the, the x and y um, uh, derivative of the image and the temporal derivative, and therefore it, in principle, only works for small motions. So you assume that you have a high camera, uh, high frame rate camera. Um, which means, in, in turn, that the difference between two images will be relatively small. And um, th this is in particular a problem that uh, when you, so when you lose a track, um, then you can't recover from it. You can't find it back afterwards with the KLT tracker. Um, and, and this means that if you make mistakes along uh, as you go, you can't correct for them afterwards. Um, so, so the question that we uh, discuss in the first part now of this lecture is how can we actually um, recover such patches again or how can we recognize them again? Um, another uh, problem where, where we need that, for example, is if we have an unordered, un unordered set of images. For example, somebody takes uh, a set of panorama images from a mountain and you, you don't really know um, uh, which, of these pet, uh, which, which of these images uh, belong together and how they actually should, should be aligned. Um, yeah. So, so there are um, some extensions of KLT trackers where you try to align whole images, uh, make them um, invariant to, um, um, yeah, to, to, to uh, or at least a bit uh, invariant to the viewing angle and so forth, forth. But it's generally not working if the, the camera motion is too large. So if you, if you would have to match these two images by eye, how would you do that, actually? Yeah. <laughs> Exactly, yeah, good, good, good idea. So you would look for distinct points that you can easily recognize again, maybe, maybe this mountain here, and then you would recognize that it potentially could be the same, so you would check maybe for this one, and then you see, ah, yeah, okay, that could be uh, the same part. And uh, yeah, and that's, that's actually a good idea. So um, we could detect features in both images, for example, the Harris corners from, from last week, um, and then find uh, corresponding pairs. Um, of these of these uh, of these feature features, and then if we found some of them, um, uh, we can we, we can in principle uh, align them. Um, good. So um, the first problem that we uh, encounter then is, uh, of course, that we need to detect the same feature points in in both images, right? So that the corner uh, detector should should be independent of um, the orientation of the camera, maybe also of the illumination, and um, yeah, and so on. Um, so, yeah. so, so this is an example of a bad corner detector that would give you different corner points uh, in, 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 in both of the images. Uh, the second problem then is that, that, you, that you need to uh, find corresponding pairs, and um, th this means that we need a, a, a way to, um, yeah, to compare two patches uh, that is also uh, invariant to uh, um, translation, maybe to rotation and illumination and so on. Good. Um, so this means that uh, ideally we are looking for a feature uh, detector and feature descriptor that um, always finds the same point uh, on, um, on the image or finds the same set of points and uh, that, that is invariant to changes in scale 
you know, if the camera is zooming in or out, or the, the person is moving closer or further away from, from an object. Insensitive to lighting, if possible. You know, the weather could change, or um, uh, uh, somebody could switch on a, a light and so on, or also the, the auto uh, gain or auto shutter of the camera could adapt. Um, of course, you also want to have it uh, insensitive to changes in per perspective. Um, you know, if you're taking, for example, a church or a house um, um, uh, camera images, then you'd like to match the tower, even if it's taken from two different uh, camera perspectives. And potentially, um, uh, the image image might be occluded, um, or parts of it might be occluded because of objects standing in the way. And um, yeah, then the feature descriptor should be invariant to that as well. Good. So last week we looked at the Harris de uh, detector, um, and um, the question now is: Is the Harris detector actually uh, rotationally invariant? Um, so remember, Harris detector means, means that we are looking for. Um, so we're looking at this this matrix for tracking the corner, uh, which consists of um, uh, the image uh, derivatives in x and y direction, and um, this essentially encodes an ellipse, and. Um, uh, the, the Harris detector more or less looked at the eigenvalues of this ellipse um, to um, uh, trigger uh, a de de detection of a corner. Um, good. So, um, do you think that uh, the Harris detector, the response of the Harris detector, is invariant to rotation? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Exactly, because it only looks um, at the, the eigenvalues um, and that does not change, you know, independent of the rotation of the whole thing. Um, good. So the corner response R of the Harris detector is invariant. So if you use, use the Har Harris detector, then it will, even if you rotate the camera, it will still give you the same uh, corners. Uh, is the Harris detector invariant to intensity change? So uh, the answer here is uh, that um, because the Harris detector only looks at derivatives, um, the absolute intensities don't really matter. Um, but the, um, the scale um, of, the, of the intensity, um, so, so you might have or you have a, a threshold somewhere here. Um, and so you're looking, you, you detect an edge whenever this uh, threshold is, is larger than a certain uh, so when this response is larger than a certain threshold, and this threshold might be different uh, for different um, uh, il illuminations or intensity um, uh, intensity values, um, but nevertheless, uh, it will hopefully select uh, the the maximums um, uh, of this. Um, so you know we have this uh, maximum non maximum suppression in the image. So you're, you're looking at the corner response at every pixel, and then whenever you find somewhere a local maximum, you select this as a corner, and um, uh, and that this means that even if you change the illumination curve, uh, the maxima will stay at the, at the same point. Maybe you get more or less, depending on what you do to the image. Uh, but in general, it will be in, um, in, invariant to intensity changes. Clear so far? Ah, um, so I don't have to. F so, so this is the, the corner response in, in, in Harris. And um, you, Harris. The Harris corner detector now checks whether this corner response is larger than a certain value, maybe 0 0.1 or something that you fine tune. So if the intensity changes, the R will not change. Um, so the, the intensity can change in, in two different ways. So um, you can either have a, a constant offset uh -huh. to the image, um, and that doesn't influence uh -huh. anything at all because the eigenvalues will still be the same, so the ellipse will be exactly the same. But you could also have a, um, a scaling factor to the intensity. You know, everything could could be double as bright, um, and and that changes the, the corner response um, because that that makes the um, the derivatives also also ma makes the derivative scale scale linearly. So if it if the image is double as bright, then um, uh, then also the gradient will be double as. Um, you know, remember the gradient is the steepness of the the image function. So, so then the steepness gets double as steep, <laughs> and uh, and that means that the eigenvalues uh, values will be double as large, or uh, root square root of of, of two, and um, 
yeah, and this means that the corner response will be scaled uh, again, and this means that suddenly points points might might fall above the threshold uh, or below, depending on how you how you scale it. But nevertheless, um, after the no, uh, the non-maximum suppression, you will still get the same corner points and maybe a little bit more and less. Good. Um, good. Is it invariant to scaling? No. Why? <laughs> Exactly, exactly. So, um, yeah, if you if you look at a curve like this, then then all of these line segments here will be treated as edges or definitely not as corners by Harris. But if you zoom out, then suddenly it will become an edge, and this means it's it's not invariant to to scale. Good. Um, this means that. Um, yeah, so, so Harris corner is in principle a, a, um, a corner detector that's easy to use um, and used a lot in practice, but there are better ones. <laughs> and uh, one that's um, probably, f especially for, for f uh, feature, feature point detection used a lot is the difference of Gaussian's uh, detector. And it um, works as follows. So and this one is uh, additionally invariant to scale. Um, so um, the idea is you remember the Gaussian filter that blurs the image. Right, and uh, it has the Gaussian filter has one parameter, namely the sigma. So you can blur it with different Gaussian kernels, either with a very small one of one pixel size, but also one could also blur it with maybe five pixels or ten pixels. And um, the idea now of the difference of Gaussians is that you that you blur the images with different sigmas, um, and then um, uh, look for a maximum um, in the. Uh, uh, in, in, in the difference of, of these um, blurred images, um, both in uh, yeah, also, also in scale. So let me, let me illustrate this. This is a, an image from taken by a camera, and uh, now it's blurred by uh, different Gaussians. And um, so a Gaussian of um, sigma equals one, two, four, and eight. And um, um, wait, this is now already the. The difference, I guess. So, yeah. So, um, so, so you, you take this image and you blur it with sigma equals one, and you blur it again with sigma equals two, and then you take the difference between these two images. Can, can you follow me so far? And this is what you what you see here. And then you do the same with sigma two and sigma four. Take the difference, and this is what you see here. Right. So um, the idea uh, then in these images is that you will get a strong response. Um, where, wherever uh, there is a large difference between the blurred image of sigma equals one and sigma equals two. So if you have suddenly structures that, that disappear when you blur it with sigma equals two, you know, then you get a response in this image. If you have things that, that are visible with sigma equals two, but not with sigma equals four, then you get a different, then you get a response here, and so on. So these difference of Gaussians here um, um, uh, sh show where you lose detail by blurring. You know, at which scale you lose detail by blurring. And um, now the idea is that for for any pixel, or for each every pixel in the image, you look at the different um, uh, scales, um, and, um, and and you you look for a maximum there. So if you so so this plot here is now so that the x-axis here is the scale. So that's the axis <laughs> here going up uh, through the images. And uh, then the idea is that you would get uh, a response like this. So maybe a pixel response at sigma equals 8, for example, or sigma equals 16, depending on where in the image it is. And um, <clears throat> uh, yeah. And this has the side effect that even if you um, uh, <laughs> So, so, so even if you if you uh, take an image with a camera zoom suddenly, or if you move closer to the object, uh, that there will be a response um, at the same pixel. Then, um, wait, I'm not sure. Um, maybe I should <laughs> explain this again. So for so so before we just looked at uh, at a, a, a pixel individually, and we looked at the Harris corner uh, detector, and then determined based on the threshold um, of the eigenvalues whether or not this would be a corner. Right, but it has the problem that when we zoom out or zoom in, that we might not get the same corners again. And now the, the general idea behind the difference of Gaussians is um, that you not only look at, at the maximum in x and y direction in the image, but also in scale space. So a maximum should should be a maximum both in x and y direction uh, and in in, this, in the scale direction. 
And this means that even if you're um, zooming into an image, um, uh, there, uh, uh, there, there will be a response in x and y direction, but also in, um, in, in, in scale direction. Not sure whether I... So right. images, the same spot should be a maximum. Exactly, exactly. So, yeah. Um, good. Sorry, but uh, so it means, uh, if we have two pictures in different scaling, um, and uh, we will find the same point. Uh, for, uh, for example, one corner is, uh, we, we can't see this corner in one scale, uh, in one picture, but we can see another picture. In this matter, we will find this color in both pictures. Exactly, exactly. And we, you will even get out the scale. So in one image, um, it might, you might get a maximum at the f um, sigma equal, equals one scale. Mm -hmm. right? And then in the other image, because it's zoomed in, you might get <coughs> um, um, a, a response at sigma equals four. Mm -hmm. right? But nevertheless, you get for the same. Uh, of course, you could run against the, the boundary here of your scale, but you can, for example, if you if you if you have a scale pyramid like this, where you where you look at um, sigma from from one to eight uh, or from one to one hundred twenty eight uh, over several um, uh, octaves in the in the Im scale space, um, you, you would still hope that you find it. I mean, of course, it only works for uh, for for the um, scale that you're looking for, that, that that you're searching through. You know, you, you say I I, I um, uh, want to be invariant of scaling variations from a factor of um, uh, sixteen, um, yeah, sixteen times larger or sixteen times smaller, and then you could run a pyramid like this, and um, yeah, g give you detections that are independent of uh, of the scale. Um, <laughs> But I, I'll continue, maybe I, I can see from your uh, eyes that <laughs> it's not completely clear. Um, good. So, so, so the idea is uh, to uh, detect the maximum not only in space, um, in, in normal image space, X and Y, but also in scale. And by doing that, um, yeah, we, we get inv invariant to, to the scaling of the images. We again do non-maximum suppression and, um, uh, yeah, and then we eliminate uh, the edge points. Um, um, maybe these two points should be switched. Ah, no, sorry. So edge points are points that are on a line, uh, but it's just, um, yeah, this is done by the Harris detector. Um, good. And uh, and then, so this is this is what the, uh, um, so, so sorry. So this is called a sift detector. Um, we detect the maxima. We suppress the non-maximum points. Um, in, in, in scale space, and uh, and then we eliminate all points that uh, that are edges, so that are points that have, um, uh, yeah, that have one large eigenvalue and one small eigenvalue, um, and then the sift detector does one uh, um, one cool thing: it um, not only outputs the pixel uh, coordinate of where we find the maximum, but it, it um, computes the pixel at su subpixel accuracy by fitting a quadratic function to this. Um, uh, response function. And by doing that you get more accurate than if you would do it on a pixel level, like the, the Harris uh, detector. So um, here's one example um, from the original SIFT uh, paper. Uh, idea is we have an input image um, of these rare dimensions. <laughs> um, using running, running this difference of Gaussians um, uh, detector gives uh, more than 800 candidates. And um, yeah, and then from there uh, they, they do some post-processing um, based on the, the contrast and uh, uh, curvature. So this is the check between the eigenvalues. And then they end up with um, several interest points scattered throughout the image. And uh, then these would be uh, points that you could use for, for matching. Good. Um, so, so this gives us now in principle repeatable corners um, between both images. E um, even if the scale changes of the image, even if the illumination changes, and even if uh, the rotation changes. Um, so the next question is, how can we reliably match two of these, um, two of these features? 
Uh, one obvious idea might be that we could uh, directly uh, extract a small patch and compare patches directly. Like last last week, we had uh, we looked at the, the sum of square differences metric. Um, yeah, and you could do something similar. Um, for example, extracting this small patch and then uh, convolve the whole image with this patch, um, which corresponds to the, the cross-correlation uh, metric, and then you would get a response like this. And then hopefully you would find that um, the points that look exactly like this pattern uh, give the strongest response, right? So that would be a really brute force check <laughs> of where have you seen this patch before. Um, now let's look at, these, uh, at the invariances. First problem obviously is it's not invariant to scaling because if the patch is larger, then there will be almost zero response. Um, it's also not uh, invariant against rotation because, um, of course, if you rotate the template, it doesn't match anymore. You could, of course, pre-rotate the template and then try different rotation angles, but that would increase the computational load uh, enormously. Um, illumination, it's also not uh, invariant against illumination. Um, you could extend it maybe. Um, and uh, the question is, uh, you know, if you would take the image from a different perspective, then also the template matching would fail, of course. So how can we do this better? And then, um, uh, th this is now where uh, the SIFT detector comes in on the SIFT descriptor, uh, which is also one of the extremely uh, influential um, papers in computer vision from uh, da David Lowe. And um, the idea is that, um, so after he, he has detected interest points in the image, um, he extracts um, a small descriptor for each of these patches that, uh, that is in principle invariant to um, to all of these uh, properties, to the rotation, scale, and so on. And um, yeah, and then so, so this canonical representation of each patch uh, can then be matched again to another image that is taken from a different viewpoint with a different background, different illumination, and so on. Good. Um, so this is the general approach. The idea is to find um, corners in the uh, in the image as described before, invariant to scale. Um, that actually gives you not only, yeah, I forgot to mention this, this not only gives you the position of the feature um, in the image, but it also gives you the scale because you know that the maximum appeared at a certain Gaussian scale of your pyramid. Um, then the next step is to find the orientation of the feature and to derotate the page. Uh, I'll show you that uh, in, in, a, in a second. And then to extract the descriptor, which is essentially um, a large vector uh, of um, uh, 128 or 256 uh, dimensions that essentially encodes a histogram over gradient directions. And that is supposed to be uh, to describe uh, the, the, sh um, the appearance of the patch um, independently of uh, rotation and so on. Good. So uh, for selecting the dominant orientation, SIF does the following. Um, so your so SIFT is again extracting a small patch, and then in this patch, um, it's computing um, the derivatives, or it's looking at the image gradient. And as you know, you can, for each pixel, compute the direction of the gradient, this theta angle. And um, the idea is then to, to make a large histogram, you know, that goes from 0 to 360 degrees, or 2 pi, um, and count um, how often you observe a certain gradient. Right, and then hopefully you find one <laughs> orientation that that gets the most most hits, and um, uh, and th this is then your orientation of the patch that you assume. Um, yeah, and this this gives you for every uh, key point now um, next to the x and y and the scale, it also gives you the orientation of the patch. And then using this orientation, um, sift derotates. The template, which means that it's now independent of, of rotation. So all patches have the same dominant gradient direction now. Good. And then SIFT extracts um, uh, the feature descriptor uh, as follows. It uh, anyway already, uh, or it, you know, it computes the image gradients um, over, over a 16 by 16 window. Um, Say so these are our pixels. This is now for visualization, it's only 8 by 8, but SIF does it on 16 by 16. It computes for every pixel um, uh, the gradient direction. Um, and, um, and then it um, uh, splits up 
uh, the patch in in a in a four by four array. It's now only visualized as a two by two array. Um, but in each of these cells, it then uh, computes again a, such an orientation histogram uh, as before, and um, uh, and then these uh, counts in the histogram uh, give give the, the SIF descriptor. So this means that the SIF descriptor ends up with 128 dimensions. Is this clear? So maybe let's go back to the overall thing. So we first detect corners um, uh, that are invariant to scale and that give us position and scale. Then we find the dominant orientation by looking at the gradients and um, that gives... Yeah. Uh, no, you're, you're, um, so you, um, you do that by, because you have to scale here from, from this one. Maybe I should go back here. I, I had the feeling that it was not, <laughs> unfortunately, not super clear. Um, okay, so we have, we have this image and we blur it. And then we take the difference between two blurred images, um, co consecutive ones. And, um, uh, this means that the, the first response will give us a pixel or will have a strong response at pixels that have small detail, uh, while this one gives give, give a strong response at pixels that have a large, uh, uh, that are somewhat larger and even larger and even larger and so on. And now we are looking for a maximum response in x and y and scale direction, and that gives us a position in the image, but also one of these levels, relatively coarse. But it will specify there is a corner point uh, at scale sigma equals four, for example. Well, just It will only, hopefully, it will it will have a clear maximum. But it could, of course, happen that there is one maximum here and another one here. There could be, of course, some strange structure, or there, there will be definitely structures that have a maximum at several points in scale space. Uh, but you would select, you would always select the one that has the highest response. So um, it's not a square, but it's like pixels versus the maximum, or when it has several maxima, then it's those pixels. Um, so. Uh, yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Now I know what you, what you mean. So um, the the patches that you're looking at are uh, in in, uh, in 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 scale space, so to speak. So when you when you detect it at a, a small sigma, then the 16 by 16 pixels will be 16 by 16 real pixels. <laughs> if it's extracted at sigma equals four, then it will be times four, for example, on a higher level of the image pyramid. Um, so the patches will have different size, relatively coarsely sampled, but uh, they, 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 the real image data will be of a different size than for every um, pixel. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, good. So, yeah. So, 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 yeah. So, uh, so this, this already happens in the first step. We select, so to speak, the x and y position and the scale level in the pyramid. And then in the next step, we uh, find the dominant orientation and can derotate the patch. And then we do some simple histogram counting on the gradient directions in this 4x4 array. And this gives us the 128 um, uh, descriptors uh, or um, values in the descriptor vector. Is this clear? Uh, not necessarily. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. Yeah, right. There will be. Um, yeah, but because it's split up into these um, um, subfields, uh, it might be not as clear. But you're right. If you're if you're looking at the histogram over the whole thing, then there will always be uh, the zero direction in which most gradients will point mm -hmm. to because we derotated it. Um, but but for the descriptor, you know, it splits it up into a four by four array. And uh, then it, it uh, has much more information. Um, but you're right. I mean, the global thing should be um, derotated and probably doesn't carry much information then anymore. But these subfields uh, carry more information, hopefully distinctive. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so, so you have uh, a 4x4 four four array of these histograms again. And uh, then you read out um, the. Uh, yeah, the counts of these histograms of all subfields, and that gives you then this long vector that describes a single patch. Okay, okay. So we compare as well. I actually saw the whole picture to, to the whole. Uh, no, only, this is only, this is only a single patch. Yeah, the single, I mean, yeah. whole patch. But uh, 
uh, we just uh, uh, we just um, how say that? So this um, yeah okay I think I understand. <laughs> So, so you have in every pixel you have um, have a have a have a gradient, and then we, you count in every subfield um, the the histogram, and then this histogram gives you gives you the descriptor vector. So, so where do we find the four by four array? So this visualization is two two. exactly yeah 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 yeah. So this visualization is made easier to 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 uh, look at. So this is eight by eight, and this is two by two, but the real SIFT <laughs> descriptor uses a sixteen by sixteen field um, and a four by four array with individual histograms in it. <coughs> okay, um, and now that we have extracted hopefully meaningful uh, descriptors from the images, how can we match them between two images? And uh, then again, we need of course a distance function that we can use to compare two features. and. Um, uh, then uh, the, the idea is to test all the features in the second image, for example, against the features in the first image and select the one with the minimum distance. Um, good. So uh, a simple approach, of course, would be just to take the Euclidean distance um, uh, between two features. Um, that works in principle well except for cases where you have repetitive features. So if you look <laughs> at, at an image like this, then of course uh, the descriptor vector of this, this part here will be more or less the same as, as this one here, because it's of course invariant to translation, invariant to rotation and perspective and so on. So what would be a good idea, or how, what would be a good way to suppress uh, ambiguous matches? And, and then the idea is that we could look at the second best match in the in the first, uh, in, the, in the second image, um, and uh, and just look at the ratio between. So how similar is um, is this patch and this patch, divided by how how similar is this patch to the second best uh, match? So how distinctive is it? And uh, and in this way, you normalize out um, things that uh, uh, yeah that are ambiguous. Uh, and in this case, you would not be able to, um, or you would not get a corresponding. Um, pair uh, because the second best match is also quite good and so it would not be distinctive. Um, good. Um, now comparing all, all features that you extracted in the first image and uh, with the features in the second image is in principle quadratic of course. If you do it in a large for loop you know then you would loop over every feature in one image and every feature in the second image and that could be quite ex um, exhaustive. <coughs> So, uh, but in principle, this is a, a nearest neighbor problem, and uh, this has been researched a lot uh, how to do that efficiently. Um, one way uh, is that you can index um, your descriptor space in a KD tree. Is, is there a question? Or okay, good. Um, I, I guess most of you will have seen KD trees before in some data structures lecture. Um, so this is a visualization of two dimensions, but we have in principle 128 dimensions. So this thing is uh, can, can be massive. Um, and now the idea is, you know, we have a query point, and um, if we have structured our data in a KD tree, uh, then we can quickly descend the tree and um, yeah, and look look for the for the nearest neighbor. Um, <coughs> um, so the idea in principle is that um, uh, yeah, you descend the tree um, um, until the, the, the lowest leaf, then you compute the neighbor from here. Um, and then it could still be that this one is not the nearest neighbor because this, our query point might be close to a boundary in the KD tree. So it might be that there is another entry somewhere here um, that is actually closer than this one, right? So you descend the tree, you find the first hit, and then you take that as a search radius that you need to check for, for closer matches. And this means that then in a second step you have to descend the tree again and then look at all leaves or all parts of the tree um, that are hit by this, um, uh, by this ellipse or by this circle. And that means you would select these leaves as well and uh, check for them and then these data points are further away so you can ignore them and then this one is the, the nearest neighbor. Um, and this, this means um, that you roughly get a log n uh, complexity for, for searching. Um, good. Uh, yeah. um, there are um, 
<coughs> so, so, so this is um, this is of course already faster, but because we have this high dimensionality, um, <coughs> um, it's um, uh, yeah, it can, can be still expensive, and uh, and this is why people came up with approximate nearest neighbor searches uh, that can uh, again speed up uh, the, the search incredibly, and. Um, one idea is that you that you add um, uh, a hashing function, which looks like a, a line in principle or like a hyperplane. So you you sample arbitrarily a plane in feature space uh, that you use to split your um, feature set into two parts. You know, one will be on one side of the plane, the other one will be on the other side of the plane. And um, <coughs> um, uh, yeah, and that this will already um, uh, remove half of the um, half of your data points, um, so that you only have to check uh, the other half. Um, this this has the yeah has the advantage that it, that it speeds up everything, but it might mean that you could miss points that are close to the plane again. So the approximate methods uh, don't give you um, the exactly nearest neighbor, but it's in many cases uh, good enough. Um, Good. Um, so, so SIFT is certainly the most used or the most influential um, uh, feature descriptor at the moment. Um, it's unfortunately not fully open source, so uh, this group is selling uh, um, licenses for their for their descriptor vector. Uh, but they have binaries that everybody in computer vision research uses <laughs> and that are free to use. There is also an OpenCV implementation of SIFT um, that's reasonably good. Um, then. Um, Recently, so SIFT is relatively slow to compute. Actually, it takes around, um, I would say, half a second on a on a decent PC for a, uh, you know maybe two or four megapixel image to compute. Um, this is why then a few years ago uh, another group had this idea of the speeded up robust features that um, uh, d don't need. Um, uh, sorry, where was. Uh, yeah, sorry, I'm not, I'm not, I forgot about the details, but it's um, it's much faster and so and still does not lose much of the accuracy. Um, recently, um, binary, so-called so binary feature de detectors, have been uh, developed that are even faster, but even even less accurate. <laughs> so it's, there is a certain trade-off depending on how good you need the descriptor to be, um, uh, yeah, versus the speed that it takes to extract it. Um, yeah, so this is just to show you that there are more feature detectors. Also, when you use OpenCV, then you might get a full list of um, things, and things that you can extract. Um, yeah, and there are constantly developed more. <laughs> um, th there is one um, uh, pr program that we developed a few years ago called RGBD Slam. It uses the Kinect to build up, um, build up a visual map. Um, so that Danilo uh, used that uh, before, uh, I think. Um, it, it takes images, it extracts surf feature points, it matches between, between images, and um, it, uh, for matching the features it uses uh, fl the FLUN library, which is an approxis nearest neighbor search. Um, yeah, and then you see, for example, so these these are this, these are two images taken in our lab in in, in Freiburg, and it um, computes with FLAN the matches, and um, then colored in green are the matches that are good. So I'll show you later how we determine that. Uh, but you also get you always get some bad matches um, that are not correct, independent of how good your feature descriptor is. So, <laughs> uh, of course, brief or orb will give even more bad matches. Um, SIFT might give a bit less. But uh, you always have the problem that a small percentage will be will be just wrong, because you also can't locally decide, right? If uh, yeah, if, if one of the patches is correct, you can you can only see that if you check the geometry at the end. Okay, um, so um, before we then start with the 3D um, estimation part, uh, how can we use these feature descriptors to determine whether we have been before at a place? And this is called uh, this this problem is called place recognition and um, um, yeah, um, ma many people are working on this, and there are different approaches. But I'll, I want to show you one um, really successful approach that is based on on these visual features. So the general problem is that you are walking around, say, with the mobile phone, <laughs> uh, a building. 
you know, and then if your if your odometry is is not as good as from the guys in Karlsruhe, then uh, you probably will have something like this uh, in the odometry estimate, and then uh, at some point you return to the same spot, but obviously in your position estimate you're not at the same spot. So it would help for your program if you could quickly determine that actually you return to the same spot. And um, how can you do that? <coughs> so, of course, one option always is that you do brute force matching with all previous images. But this is extremely slow and extremely costly. Um, yeah, because, yeah, because you have to match against all images. Um, so the question is, can we use the feature descriptors to make this faster? And uh, the idea is that, it's, that this problem is actually similar to document retrieval, so like things that Google does or search engines or databases do. Um, so um, you, you want to find um, a document that is in our case an image that contains as many um, similar words as our uh, query image. So we have one current image that we're looking at and we're now looking and we now want to know from our database which are the images that are most similar to what we are currently looking at. And then the idea is to uh, look at um, distributions over words in these documents. Um, yeah, and, and just compare, compare these distributions. So the idea is um, that in, instead of comparing the whole image, we split up the object into visual words, that is in our case the visual features. <laughs> and then we don't care anymore about the ordering of these, of these features in the image. We just look, is this feature present or is it not present? And, um, yeah, and this, this gives us then the bag of visual words. And um, yeah, <laughs> so that's in principle this visualization. And um, uh, now, um, um, in, in, instead of detecting, uh, or uh, so, so, so one um, um, important component is that we construct first a dictionary of visual words. So you look at, you, you take some training data, for example, you walk around through buildings or around buildings in the type of environment that, you, that you're interested in, you extract feature descriptors, and then you build up um, a dictionary of all the most frequent words that you encounter. So for example, if you're looking at faces and music instruments and bikes, then you would get a set of visual words that might look like this. Um, uh, that are hopefully rep representative for your data. And, um, and then when you see an image, you will you just count how often um, yeah, do, do I see a certain uh, visual word then in the image. For example, for the face, you would go to get strong responses for uh, these two uh, features. For the bike, you would get a strong response for a bike word. And for the music instrument, you would get here a strong uh, response. And, um, and then just by comparing these feature descript uh, these histograms, you could then quickly tell what you're probably looking at. Um, good. So the, the whole idea is as follows. We um, uh, uh, take the input images, we um, uh, run them against our, code uh, our, our dictionary of code words, and, um, and that gives us then a histogram of the, the word occurrences. Um, more in terms of our uh, SIFT features. Uh, this is now one of the input images. Here you can see the different detections. Um, here you again can see different, the different sizes of the ellipses correspond or visualize the different scale of the features. At each of these uh, uh, features, we, we, we extract a descriptor vector. Um, yeah, and that gives us a, um, a set of uh, descriptor vectors. And um, instead of using them directly, um, it's, it's a good idea to, to cluster them beforehand using k-means, for example, or any clustering algorithms. So, you know, all of these features here, uh, or we will get, we will get lots, of, lots of visual features. For example, if you extract 500 or 1,000 feature descriptors per image and you have 1,000 images, then you will quickly have 1 million of these different uh, descriptors. So to boil that down a little bit, the idea is that you put all of them um, together in a, in, a, in a database and then you look for, um, for clusters in, this, in, in these feature descriptors. And then every cluster uh, will get represented by only the cluster center and that will then be your code word. Um, so, for example, um, this, these are images from um, pa Paul Newman's group, um, uh, and I'll show you a video of that uh, as well. So they had a car that was driving around and uh, taking images, and um, and then from all of them, 
from, from all of these images, they extract um, features and cluster them, and then they visualize them again. This is not a really intuitive step, uh, because when you go to sift space, uh, then you can't really go back to, to the features. So I'm not really sure how they computed it, but this is maybe just for uh, illustration. Um, Okay, and then uh, based on this um, ba based on this code book or uh, based on this dictionary, you get a new image, and then um, you count how often you see the indiv individual um, code words in this image, and this gives you a histogram like this. Good, and then um, the only thing that, that remains then to be done is uh, for a new scene, uh, you need to uh, determine the distance to all um, known scenes, um, and um, uh, yeah, and then one, one easy measure that people always use is the, the histogram intersection, um, where you just look at, you know, there is, um, yeah, say we have two images, um, or we, so we have two images in our database, and we have one new query image of which you don't know where it comes from, uh, and then uh, you, you just take the minimum of, of um, the image you're matching against and your current image, um, and yeah. And then this, this gives you a score when you sum over the minimum between the two. Um, good. Yes? Uh, how big should we read the windows of these features? The, the what? The, the windows, the size of these um, So if you use SIFT, you know, then it's a 16 by 16 pixel patch. Uh, but the, the actual size um, depends on the this, um, the scale at which the, the image feature was extracted. So at the lowest level, it would be a 60 by 16, but if it's higher, then it could correspond to, you don't know, uh, maybe even 128 by 128 original pixels in the image. This is to make it invariant of, um, of the scale. The car could be further away from a house or closer to a house, but you still want to get the same uh, descriptor then. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. So this, um, this uh, so I, I did not mention this here because we're not dealing with object recognition in this course, but the very same approach is used for object recognition. Um, yeah, good point. Uh, the one, one problem is that it uh, does not give you the location, <laughs> the exact location of the object, but when you have a good match, if, if the, um, um, the score that you get by comparing the histograms is, is really high, then you know that the object is probably in the image. Also, you don't know exactly where because the position information is lost in this while you compute the histogram. Um, yeah. So this is uh, one of the cars that they uh, that they have in, in Oxford. Actually, is somebody of you taking Rudolf Triebel's course on machine learning? No. Ah, okay, cool. Um, so this was, I think, before Rudy joined the lab. So they, they have been looking at um, place recognition and visual slam um, for a long time now. And um, the cool thing is, so this car is, is going around through England uh, on a really long trajectory. Um, I mean, this is, this is a sh the first trajectory, but they did it for 1,000 kilometers. And they used this approach to detect... Um, to detect uh, um, whether, whether or not they have been there before. And whenever it detects that, you know, it colors it red. And you can see it, it goes around, uh, and uh, it's, not, it's not perfect. It's not always responding. Um, but uh, it, it doesn't give any false positives. So you can fine tune this automatically in such a way that you, that you never get uh, bad matches, even at um, if, you, if you go at, uh, on, on different days and so on. So this is, these are now uh, several runs of this car and you can see that whenever it returns that it, it um, uh, g gives good candidates for matching. And um, the, the cool thing is that um, the, uh, the query uh, is extremely fast. So it's, it's still uh, linear in the number of previous images that you have because you have to compare against all previous histograms but comparing com comparing a histogram is, is relatively fast right because it's only maybe 1,000 numbers or maybe 50,000 numbers depending on how large your codebook is um, but it's it's a very simple operation that you that you have to do um, yeah so in, in this case they can do uh, the inf inference in, in 25 milliseconds for 100,000 locations um, while the extraction of the self features um, and the quantisa quantization into uh, the codebook takes roughly half a second. So you see this is a really expensive step but you only have to do it once per image. Um, and uh, this is a really fast step 
um, but depending on how large, uh, how, how far you travel, uh, this could again become costly at some point. Good. Um, so this was a brief summary on place recognition. There is in principle, of course, more to say about that. Um, would also be an interesting mini project or a further project then, um, further down, down uh, uh, the road. Um, so the cool thing is that the bag of words uh, gives you a really compact uh, representation of the content of an image. You can also use it for object recognition, <laughs> um, but also for scene recognition. Um, it's, it's very efficient and, and scales very well. Um, it requires the pre-training of a dictionary. And um, um, it's in principle insensitive to viewpoint changes or image deformations because this is already what our image descriptor uh, does for us. Uh, you know, so we benefit from all the um, invariants that we that we have before. Good. Um, and this now <laughs> brings us to the uh, structure for motion problem. Are there questions so far? Okay. Good. Um, so now we have a way to uh, find uh, interest points that are invariant to all kinds of deformations of the image. Um, and we can compute correspondences between two or more images. Uh, what can we use this for? And there is a whole bunch of important um, uh, computer vision problems. Oh, I just see that there is a return missing. Whoop. Um, so the, the first problem that I'll look at, or we'll actually look at the first three problems uh, now until the end of the lecture and the next week at the bundle adjustment problem. First problem is you're looking at the scene where you know um, some, some 3D points uh, that you're observing. So like you're looking at a calibration board, for example, or you're looking at um, uh, an object of which you know the dimensions. Um, you see some 2D feature points on it. Um, uh, and then you want to compute a camera pose from this. So this is called camera calibration or camera resection. Uh, the next problem is um, if you have the known camera poses um, some t and you, have, you see some 2D features in both uh, cameras, you want to compute the 3D point then. Right? This is called just point triangulation. Um, and then <laughs> the third problem is motion estimation, which means that we, we have two frames uh, take two images, for example, with your mobile phone, and uh, you match, you get 2D point correspondences, but nothing more. And then you want to compute the camera pose, um, which you can do only up to scale, and potentially, again, the 3D points in the world. Um, but primarily, you are interested in the motion of the camera between the two frames. And then next, next week, you will look at the problem if you have more than two frames, um, how you can uh, find the camera uh, positions and uh, the locations of the 3D points um, together jointly. You can. In but yeah, it's, you, yeah, right. So it's, you never know the scale. Uh, I'll show you. So Yeah, you don't know the absolute distance um, because you don't know how much the camera moved. You can never distinguish between a toy world where you have a very small camera moving around in, in very small houses or whether you have a normal camera that's moving around in a village. Uh, you can't distinguish that from only one eye. For that, you need uh, a second camera uh, that has a known distance, for example, or any other method for measuring absolute distances. But you, so this is why at, at various places you will now see up to scale, <laughs> which means that we can't recover the scale from only one. Um, so the quadrocopter has more sensors, <laughs> and then it becomes again possible. The quadrocopter has an ultrasound sensor to the bottom, and that again means that also the odometry that you get is actu actually already at an absolute scale. So if you take two different images at two different locations, you uh, roughly know the baseline. And, and that again will allow you to compute absolute distances. Um, but, but from a camera alone, it's not possible. You, you can't distinguish, distinguish this. And this is a really important insight, so I'll stress it at, at more points. <laughs> um, so I should mention that all of these problems um, um, are really important, and so lots of people have thought about solutions for it. And um, there are different solutions that have different properties. And um, in 
Um, in, in this course, I, I um, mostly show you the simple ones because they are easier to understand. They might need more points to compute, um, to compute uh, the parameters that we are interested in. Um, and um, on the other hand, uh, methods that use less points are uh, more um, sensitive to, to noise and probably also to conditioning. Um, so you have to keep that in mind. So if you're looking for a really good solution, it makes sense to, uh, to dive deeper in this topic or to use better implementations that uh, are, for example, partially in, available in OpenCV. Um, but uh, the things that, that I'll show are um, yeah, relatively easy to, to follow and, and give you a good initial understanding of what we're actually trying to do and how it can be done. Good. So the camera calibration problem is uh, the following. That's actually, you can think of this as, this is the problem that is solved by the markers. So when the AR drone is looking at the visual marker on the floor, we know that we are looking at an object that has four corner points uh, that we can potentially extract, you know, using a specialized filter. And, um, and then from these four or say three, corner points, um, we want to determine the, the camera pose um, uh, such that uh, the projections of these points in, in, in the real world correspond to the observed locations in the image. Right? So we have in this, case, in this example three points in the real world and, and then three uh, points on the image plane and we want to find um, the camera rotation and translation, maybe also the camera intrinsics K, um, such that the projection of these points to these points match. Good. So we have um, we have n correspondences between 2D points and 3D points, and um, we want to find uh, the projection matrix M that is composed of you know the camera intrinsics times rotation and translation, such that these 3D points get mapped onto the 2D points. So our first question is how many degrees of freedom does M actually have? So everybody of you should be able to answer this question. <laughs> um, y6. True, yeah. So the rotation here definitely has three degrees of freedom and the translation has another three. But now M is not the rigid body transformation, but it's a projection matrix. So there is additionally this K here. Do you remember what K is? The in camera intrinsics. And what does it contain? Mm -hmm. So it's the focal length and the optical center. So you, you might remember this. Um, so, so K is in principle, um, you know, focal length in X direction, focal length in Y direction. There might be a skew factor and then the camera center in X and Y um, direction. So, it, so K has five degrees of freedom in the general case. And this means that the projection matrix by itself has 11 degrees of freedom because it's, it's six degrees of freedom here and five here. Um, and this is, it's also clear that it, so M in principle has 12 entries, you know, because it's a four by three, uh, three by four matrix. Um, but it's, it's only determined up to scale because we are dealing here with homogeneous coordinates. So if you multiply uh, it with a, a certain factor, it, it, it still gives the same projection. Um, um, 11. 11. Um, so the, the projection matrix has 11 degrees of freedom in the general case because we have 5 degrees in the intrinsics and 6 degrees in the uh, rotation and translation. Um, good. And now the, the algorithm for camera calibration looks as follows. First we compute this projection matrix and then we decompose it into the individual three components. Good. So the first step is um, that uh, we want to estimate M. And um, Obviously, if you if you look at you know this, if you look at these equations, uh, then you see that um, uh, that uh, every correspondence between or every point that we observe gives us two equations, namely one for the x-axis and one for the y-axis in the image, right? And um, now you can of course multiply with the denominator here, and um, uh, and then we get uh, this um, coordinate system. And the cool thing is that it's linear in the elements of M, <laughs> right? So, um, does everybody see this so far? So it's, it's just, if you multiply it out, multiply with the denominator, you get end up with these equations here. And, and you can rearrange them in matrix form um, 
obviously, so if you stack all the elements of M in a, in a vector, you know, in a 12 uh, dimensional vector, you multiply it with them, uh, with, with, with these um, values here, uh, then you get two lines of such a matrix. And now if you have more than six or six or more correspondences, um, you get a large uh, linear uh, equation, system of linear equations uh, that you can solve. And we are looking here for the vector M, um, that multiply so so a multiplied by this vector should be zero and this means that uh, the wanted vector is in the null space uh, of of a and um, uh, and therefore it can be easily computed using um, singular value decomposition and then you would just choose the vector that has the least singular value and um, uh, d d this um, yeah this gives you at least an initial solution and then you can uh, refine. Um, uh, this uh, using using nonlinear uh, minimization, if you if you want to. In in any case, um, this gives us um, uh, the matrix M now um, that we need to to decompose. And um, the the first insight here is the, the that K is actually um, uh, an upper triangle triangular matrix, right? Because it has this has this shape. We know that, um, and um, now we can just use um, a variant of QR decomposition, which decomposes a matrix into um, an upper triangular part and an um, um, orthogonal part. Um, and then directly, yeah, and, and this gives us directly K and, um, wait, sorry, it just, yeah, yeah, so this directly gives us, so, so uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, so we just look at the, um, the, um, so, so K is a three by four matrix, right? And we now um, will just look at the first three by three part of this matrix and factorize it using QR decomposition. That will directly return us K and R, and that, that's already what we what we need. And then we can directly compute the translation um, from um, yeah fr 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 from the remaining parts. Um, yeah, 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 right. So it's it's actually LQ decomposition, um, true. But it's a variant, so QR is more, uh, yeah, more familiar. But the, uh, yeah, you can have this in all directions actually. But you're right. So the, this is the upper triangular part, and this is the orthonormal part that we that we want. And you need have to cho choose then the right uh, solver for this. Good. So so this gives us uh, the intrinsics, uh, the camera rotation, and the translation vector. Um, and this is. Um, uh, yeah, as, as I said, one um, application of this is to find uh, the camera uh, pose, um, and a very similar method is used in the AR toolkit markers. Um, so the approach here is that it, it thresholds the image um, into a to, to a binary image, so you just that you just have one or zeros afterwards. Then it detaches, uh, detects edges, and um, and fits lines uh, to them. Um, uh, yeah, so, so actually it first um, uh, looks for blobs, you know, for black blobs. This is why you need the black border around it. Um, on these uh, blobs, it detects edges and then fits four lines. And then it intersects these four lines to get four corner points. And then these are the points of which we know the corresponding 3D points then. And, um, and using that, it estimates a projection matrix N, M. And then it, it uses a similar approach to uh, to extract uh, directly rotation and translation, and the AR toolkit assumes that you have K. You know, it does not make sense to estimate these five degrees of freedom all the time, <laughs> um, because they usually remain constant. Um, uh, yes? Um, yeah, uh, because we know where the marker is in the world. Oh, so you, yeah, yeah. No, or, okay. Uh, yeah, you have you have different. Um, um, I mean, what, what you can actually compute is the the relative position of the camera to the marker, and you could, for example, say I know that the marker is like in our case located on the floor at the origin of our coordinate system, and then we want to know where the camera is with respect to this to this marker. In this case, um, she is looking. She has a special um, uh, video glo um, goggles on uh, with a camera, and then looking at the marker, and then you get the relative um, 
pose of the head with respect to this. Um, Sorry. Yes. Exactly, it gives you the absolute position. So, so, so you've been using the markers so far with the AR drones, I, uh, I think, right? And uh, they, they give you the, the absolute uh, position directly from one camera image. Because this is possible because we know the side length in real world coordinates and then, then you can really get the absolute scale. Um, and then the cool thing is that uh, this uh, can get extremely accurate. Um, um, it of course depends. The AR drone images are always a bit shaky and so on. Um, but if you have a good camera, um, the, the estimates of the lines will be super accurate uh, because they are ideally, you know, if the image is large enough, then you have hundreds of pixels that, that constitute the line. And then the line already will be super accurate. And then you boil down the whole line to one intersection point with another line. And then this point will be super accurate. Um, and, and this means that, uh, yeah, the the, um, the projected points will be known up to, say, 0 0.02 pixels, for example, and that means, again, that also the camera rotation and translation will be really accurate. Um, but, again, th this depends on your, on your camera or, or also and on your marker. <laughs> um, so when the quadrocopter flies over it and then it starts to um, fly in the wind, then um, <laughs> it's probably less accurate. What? Yeah, exactly. And the bigger the marker, the easier it gets, because then the more points you have to estimate this. Good. So <clears throat> next problem is uh, triangulation, which means that we have n cameras, um, in the easiest case two, and both of them see, um, see a feature, and they have identified that it's the same feature that they are looking at. And then you want to know the corresponding point in, in 3D. <clears throat> um, and um, so we want to compute a point P, you know, that has um, um, uh, in homogeneous coordinates X, Y, Z, W. And um, of course, using the protection matrix um, uh, of both cameras, and we know, we assume that we have the protection matrix. So in this case, we, we know the camera poses, we know the features, but we don't know the 3D point. Um, um, but uh, yeah, so, so, so given any, value for p we could compute where we would expect it in both camera images and then of course we would be looking for a point p that that minimizes the distance of the observed uh, features to the predicted features right so we would shift around this point p so long until the distance between the projection of p and the observed feature location would be minimal good um, so we can apply, again, the same, same trick. We multiply with the denominator, which gives us uh, two linear um, um, uh, equations. Uh, there are, as I indicated, here three solutions how to do that. You can either uh, assume that W equals 1, which may, means that we are not using homogeneous coordinates anymore. This um, might be a bit instable um, when... Um, uh, the, the points are very far away. Um, another another option is to use um, it, um, yeah, to to, um, to find again this point using um, a singular value decomposition, looking for a homogeneous vector that um, that is in the null space of this matrix that we're building up, uh, and then afterwards it always makes sense to uh, do uh, nonlinearly squares or directly start with nonlinearly squares, uh, which is even more accurate. Good. Um, okay, and now I'll come to the last part, um, the, um, uh, the two-frame bundle adjustment or the problem of estimating the motion between two cameras. Before we, before we do that, I um, want to introduce you to the concept of epipolar geometry, which you might have heard before. Um, the idea is as follows. So we have two cameras and they are looking at, uh, they, they, they are looking at, um, at, at um, so, so both of them see, um, no, wait, let me start here. So we have one camera and it looks through, um, it, it detects a feature somewhere. And then we know, of course, that this has to correspond to a world point that is somewhere located along this ray, obviously. And um, now we have a second camera and uh, this, the second camera observes the same world point, but we, um, um, ah, wait. Let me start over, sorry. <laughs> um, so, so we have two cameras and they are looking at, at the same world point and uh, there is, we know that there is a certain translation and rotation between the two cameras. 
and um, and if you look at the camera centers, then the line connecting both camera centers is called the baseline. We will need this more next week. This is the distance between uh, the two cameras. Um, and now this um, th um, 3D point in the world that the first camera observes um, also projects in the, to the second camera, of course. And depending on the depth or the distance of this point along this line, this point will appear in the second camera image also along a line, so somewhere along a line, right? And, um, and this line is called the epipolar line of this point X in the left image, right? So, so if you have an object here that's moving back and forth, um, uh, this, this object would be projected in the second, um, in the second camera um, and it uh, yeah, would, would move along a line and this line is called the epipolar line. Um, good. Now, if we have um, <laughs> so, so if we have two two features in both images, and we have identified already that the, both cameras are looking at the same um, the, the same point in the in the in the world, uh, then we can form two camera rays. One camera ray starting from here, passing through this feature along this ray, and a second uh, camera, uh, a second ray from the um, from the second camera uh, camera looking looking through this feature. So in both cases, we would get a line equation that looks somewhat like this. So we have the first point is um, or P P one is um, you know some distance times um, this direction um, uh, direction of the ray. Um, and we get the same for the second camera, right? And so now this, these two lines in principle have to, have to match, but of course um, these two rays are given in, in two different coordinate systems. One is in the left coordinate frame and the other one is in the right coordinate frame. So we can, um, but because we know the translation and rotation between the two cameras, we can transform um, this, uh, this ray into the right camera frame just by multiplying it with the rotation matrix and adding the translation. Now we have a camera ray in, in, the, uh, in the right uh, camera frame. And, and then we know that both points should be the same, right? So P1 prime should be the same as P2. So we can just uh, um, yeah, uh, put them equal. And, and then there are two nice um, transformations that we can do. And it, this is a bit tricky to see, but I'll... Uh, walk you through. So, so this is the first thing that, that happens when we, so we, we just set it equal to each other and then we multiply um, from the uh, left side with the cross product of the translation vector. So you know that uh, for, for any ve vector we can express this, um, um, the cross product as a, as a matrix operation and um, a matrix can be left multiplied to anything and it should not change the equation. So when we do that, uh, we get the, uh, the um, cross product of the translation vector on the left side and on the right side. So this D here can be pulled forward because it's just a scalar. And uh, then the cross product of T times T is zero, of course, because uh, cross product um, yeah, uh, between, between uh, two vectors that are um, parallel uh, is zero. Um, and then um, again, we multiply on the left side uh, with um, um, uh, yeah, with a x2, and that will um, um, uh, wipe out this term here on the left. So if we do that, wait, but why is this again? Ah, yeah, because we have so we have x2 um, multiplied by, with the cross product, which will, um, you know, if you have two vectors, it will uh, it will give uh, a vector orthogonal to both of them, the the, the input vectors, uh, and then we multiply it again with x2, which which should have, which is zero, of course, because um, yeah, after after the multiplication with the cross product, so this gives us. Um, leaves us with the following simple equation. Uh, it says that uh, x2 times um, cross product of t times rotation matrix times x1 is zero. And this is, and now if we, um, so, so now these two, so t, the cross product of t times r um, is called the epipolar matrix. And then the resulting equation is called the epipolar constraint. 
and um, yeah, and it, it just says that there is a matrix E of size three by three that when, when you multiply it by the um, uh, positions of the, the features in one image and the other features uh, and, 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 and the other image should be zero for corresponding corresponding points. So once again, for every two corresponding points, when you put them into this equation, they, uh, or this equation should hold. And um, yeah. And this E is called the essential matrix. Um, good. And uh, this, this insight of epipolar geometry um, can now be used to, uh, to estimate the, the 3D motion between two camera images. So the idea is we have two camera images. We have established n point correspondences between both. And now we want to extract uh, the rotation and translation. Uh, as we discussed before, we can only get translation up to scale. And there are different famous uh, algorithms for it. Um, I will discuss the eight-point algorithm and the normalized eight-point algorithm, but there are other algorithms that are really hard to, to implement, um, like the six-point and the five-point algorithm. Um, and uh, I'll show you later why this has sometimes an advantage, but this one is certainly probably the, mo the best understood and the, the most uh, yeah, often um, implemented one. Good. Um, so the general idea is that uh, we first estimate the essential matrix E from at, least, uh, from at least eight point correspondences. And then from this matrix E, we recover rotation and translation. So first part is, again, we need to estimate E. And um, uh, yeah, and it, it, so, so, this, is, this, so, so, so this, this constraint here gives for, for every point correspondence gives, gives exactly uh, one linear equation, right? If you if you write this out, then you get this long expression here, but it, it's just a linear expression. It says, um, yeah, something multiplied by the elements of this matrix E um, uh, equals zero, right? So so if we reorder this a little bit and we um, um, pull all the red terms out in a vector set and all the elements of E in a vector yeah, in a stacked vector of this matrix E, then we can rewrite this linear equation as uh, the following product between two vectors. And um, uh, yeah, and, and this means that every correspondence between two points in, in the two images uh, gives us one constraint. And um, so we can again uh, stack all of these constraints, and that gives us um, yeah gives us a large matrix set, and um, yeah, and then again we have a, a linear system. You see, this has again a similar shape. Uh, a large matrix set times a vector equals zero. So we can solve that. Th this means E must be in the null space, and we can solve that again with um, with the singular value decomposition. Um, now there is one one problem that, of course, the uh, the noise the um, the, the um, pixel positions of our features will be somewhat noisy, right? And um, now, depending on the scale of your image, um, or the, uh, actually, the, the, so the bad thing is uh, in this estimation procedure that some of the elements here have more noise than others. For example, this one doesn't have noise at all. Uh, some other elements have once the noise, and other elements where, you have, where we have to multiply x1 times x2, for example, have the noise even even twice in it. And this means um, um, that. Uh, some parts of this estimation are more sensitive to noise than others. And um, now the idea of the normalized state point algorithm is that, um, that all points um, in the image you know, are, are normalized uh, to have zero mean and unit variance, uh, to remove that a bit. That, so the danger is, you know, if you have, uh, so, so the estimation here depends on the scale of x, x and y. For example, you could have the scale uh, or the, the, the pixel positions go from 0 to 640 or 639 if you have a VGA image, but it could also be much larger. And um, yeah, and, and uh, alternatively, you could have it as going from 0 to 1 or minus 1 to 1 and so on. And in, in any, in, in, uh, depending on the scale, you would get different values, you would get a certain bias in the, in the, in the E that you're getting out of it. And one easy way to get to normalize that out is to uh, yeah, normalize the correspondences. Good. Um, and then the, um, yeah, we need to recover rotation and translation. As we discussed, 
you can never uh, find uh, the, the absolute scale only from from two images if you don't know um, if you don't know any absolute um, distance in the image um, so you can't so this is an, you can't distinguish between two cameras looking at the small world or two cameras looking at the large world you, you just can't know um, uh, no, not even with three or n cameras. Uh, it, it could always be, you know, if it's like if you if you close one of your eyes and you walk around, um, or if you have, yeah, you, you get a, a video feed, you, you don't really know uh, how large the world is. It could always be a toy world, or it could be the normal world. You, you can't distinguish this. Um, okay, so now that we have the, the essential matrix E, remember that it originally comes from a cross product, a cross product of T times uh, rotation matrix, um, and that this means that um, T, the translation vector, is actually, or the scaled um, T, is in the null space of E. Um, this must be the case because if we multiply t from the left to e, then you see that t is then multiplied by the cross product of t times r, and this is guaranteed to be zero. So uh, this means that the translation vector must be in the null space. And this means that we can, for example, decompose e using, using SVD, and uh, then we should get two um, singular values of roughly the same magnitude and one value that should be zero ideally or close to zero and then um, the vector that corresponds to this um, 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 zero um, singular value is, is, is the translation vector or the scale variant of the translation vector good and um, yeah, now for getting the rotation vector out, uh, the rotation matrix out is a bit more uh, difficult. Um, one thing that, that can help to understand this is um, remember again what a cross product does. So essentially you have two vectors um, multiplied, or if you take the cross product between two vectors, it spits out a third vector that's perpendicular to both of them. So this actually means um, that um, any vector that you put into the cross product um, is is projected on a set of uh, um, uh, on, on an orthogonal uh, basis, like with this example, um, and um, and then it's um, and then only the part that is not um, that is not uh, parallel to the to the to the vector that you're multiplying with uh, is is kept. So it essentially zeroes out um, the component the, the the t component. Um, and, and it, it ro rotates the other two basis vectors around 90 degrees. So this is what makes one vector you know, that, you, that you put into uh, the cross product move up. So you, you could, or you can in principle rewrite the cross product as um, um, uh, you know, in, in, into this projection on a set of basis vectors, as zero, as one, include and t, then um, uh, a, a rotation, um, um, oh, so wait. I think these two should be flipped. Um, there is, so, so then, a zeroing out of the T component um, and a rotation of 90 degrees of the remaining two. Um, yeah, and then back rotation again. And um, uh, by, by, by doing this, um, we, or we can now use this insight to uh, recover the rotation matrix. Um, uh, from from E, and we do that as follows. We know that this um, cross product is an, uh, essentially the same as multiplication of this um, coordinate transform times the zeroing out times the rotation around 90 degrees times uh, again the spaces uh, thing and um, uh, rotation matrix. And uh, by identifying this now with the components in the fr from the from this uh, singular value decomposition. Um, uh, we, we can retrieve uh, the rotation vector um, yeah, just by uh, identifying it. And um, now one tricky part is that um, uh, the, um, uh, the, this matrix U and V are not necessarily rotation matrices, so it, it can happen uh, that, um, that uh, um, that we have to flip signs in the rotation. Um, so when you when you recover R, you have to make sure you, you get in principle four different solutions, and you have to find the right one. And um, um, to, to do that, um, 
we know that uh, the rotation matrix should have a uh, uh, determinant of one to be a proper rotation matrix. And um, yeah, that, so that's the first condition that will uh, rule out two of the, of the solutions that you get. Uh, and then you can use that to triangulate the points in 3D. And uh, then, of course, we want to have the solution where the points are in front of the camera, right? Through noise and so on. It might happen that some of the points are actually behind the camera. <laughs> uh, but it still means that we can select the solution uh, that has the largest point, uh, number of points in front of the camera. And this is, uh, yeah, this is how um, the eight-point algorithm and the decomposition and rotation and translation can be done. Good. So to summarize again, we get an image pair in, uh, and then uh, we want to find the camera motion uh, consisting of the rotation and translation. We do that as follows. We compute correspondences between two images. From them, we compute the essential matrix. And uh, from the essential matrix, we extract uh, rotation and translation up to scale. Good. Um, then I would say um, we stop here. And then we'll continue next week with, um, with outlier uh, detection and outlier removal. Good. So this means today we looked at uh, how to detect and match feature points in images, um, how to efficiently recognize places that we've been there before. Uh, we've also looked at the eight-point algorithm, which means to estimate the camera motion between two images. And, uh, and then next week we'll continue with uh, dealing with outliers. Good. Thank you very much. Any questions? Okay, good. Then see you next week. <laughs>